Good afternoon. Um, we're going to, even though everybody is still eating and some of the desserts have not been uh, have not been served yet, we're going to get started with the program in order to have enough time for Governor Beasley and Mr. Meyer to have a nice conversation and then some questions from the audience afterwards. So we will start with the awards and then move on to the uh, conversation that'll be over there. Please continue to eat. Uh, don't forget your dessert when it comes. Don't tell them no, you don't want it. So thank you all for being here today and sharing your time to honor the three well-deserving leaders. But first, let's thank this staff that is working really hard to serve us and be quiet. I'm Diana Lawson, the Dean of the Seidman College of Business at Grand Valley State University, and I'm a member of the World Affairs Council Board of Directors. So for today's program, I have the pleasure of making the first award presentation, the Hillman Orr Award. Following, following this award, our good friend Renee Tabin of Bank of America will present the Vandenberg Prize. And as I just said, that will fall, be followed with a conversation with Mr. Meyer and Governor Beasley. And then you get to ask questions. So let's begin. I get to introduce the two recipients of the 2023 Hillman Orr Award. Both clearly live the values intent and intent of this award. So for a short background of this award, Judge Hillman and Mr. Orr founded the World Affairs Council in 1949. It was to provide individuals, educators, and business leaders a space to give and receive ideas and information about West Michigan's engagement with other nations. Today, the council continues to serve that purpose with programming, including the Great Decision Series. They provide opportunities for exchange between local companies and foreign diplomats and other events like today's event. For almost 20 years, our award recipients, Sonia Johnson and Kendra Coe, have created a collaborative, a collaborative team that has fueled this economy to think globally in business in trade, and in being culturally intelligent. They are one of West Michigan's best kept secrets, working behind the spotlight to support global trade. We are grateful for and proud of their work. They have significantly expanded the international reach of many organizations in West Michigan and across the state. So a little bit about the journey of how we got to today with Sonia and Kendra. The partnership between the U.S. Commercial Service and Grand Valley State began in 1996. The Van Andel Global Trade Center was founded in 1999. The two organizations have been partners in organizing international uh, globally focused events. The World Trade Week is one of them that we have been offering since 2000. And Trade Week has been offered every year for 38 years except in 2020. Sonia began working with the Van Andel Grade, uh, Trade Center in 2003 and became the executive director three years later. Kendra joined the Grand Rapids office of the U.S. Commercial Service in 2004, so it just happened to work well that they started around the same time. As noted, over the years, the Trade Center and the Commercial Service together created a synergy that has led to a greater impact on the global reach of West Michigan providing a more comprehensive and productive approach to supporting the global growth of our businesses. As noted, Sonia started with the Trade Center in 2003. She is a licensed U.S. customs broker with a specialization in global supply chain, customs compliance, and foreign trade zone administration. They were really busy during COVID. She also serves as the director of the Kent, Ottawa, Muskegon Foreign Trade Zone Authority. As far as we know, Grand Valley is the only university overseeing an FTZ in the country. Under Sonia's leadership, the membership in the Trade Center has grown and remains strong with over 270 members. With a staff of only three, the Trade Center annually helps answer over 2,600 questions on international topics. They complete, they've completed over 100 consulting projects for businesses. They train over 1,500 business professionals. 
and they connect with over 200 students, some of who serve as student interns. In 2019, the Van Andel Global Trade Center received the U.S. President's E Award. This award is created by the executive order of the president. It is the highest recognition any U.S. entity can receive for making a significant contribution to the expansion of U.S. exports. Kendra, prior to joining the commercial service in West Michigan, worked for the service in Atlanta for four years. She also has served on temporary assignments at the U.S. Consulate in Shanghai and the American Institute of Te Taiwan. She is a certified global business professional. As the director of the commercial service in Grand Rapids, Kendra advises U.S. companies on international business strategies, providing them with custom customized counseling and matchmaking, matchmaking solutions. Kendra's accomplishments are numerous. She has advised over 1,000 clients and mentored more than 35 students over her career, many of them in this area. Her commitment to helping U.S. Export, export, exporters grow earned her national recognition for, from the Department of Commerce with the Bronze Star Award. Nasbite International, an organization whose mission is to advance global business practice, education, and training, recognized Kendra's accomplishments with the Advancing International Award. In addition to all of that, Kendra also serves as the Executive Secretary of the West Michigan District Export Council. She is the co-chair for the Student Global Awareness Program and is an advisory board member for Michigan State University's Center for International Business Education and Research. And as an academic, I know that is a very highly regarded center for international business research and education. Finally, I had the privilege of informing Sonia and Kendra about the award. When I told them about the Hillman Orr Award, they were both really surprised. They said, and I'm paraphrasing, but they both said this, we aren't the ones that get these awards. We help and celebrate others who receive them. Now it's their turn, and it's our delight to present both Sonia and Kendra with the 2023 Hillman Orr Award. Please join me in congratulating them. I don't know, I'm committing a faux pas going in front of our federal partner here, but just a few quick words. Yes, we were pretty stunned. Thank you so much to the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan. It is a true honor and extremely humbling to receive the Hillman Orr Award. It is wonderful to see, receive the recognition and this magnitude for something that I care so much about. It has been a pleasure to get have the opportunity to get to feed my curiosity about the world, cultures, history, and explore what can be done to grow international business and bring it to our local community. As we reflect on the path that's gotten me here today, I, it's hard to believe that the girl as a teen who was walking beans, anybody not familiar with that term? It's where you walk through ro rows of soybeans and pull weeds. I had a many time, much time on my hands to wonder about what the future was going to be. It wasn't going to be in a field. And that's where my dream started to grow. I wanted to do something with international. And fortunately, I had the opportunity after receiving my undergraduate degree to get on a plane for the first time and head to Seattle, Washington. And I got the support of my family. So again, thanks mom and dad for all the support. Um, I don't know if I'd feel as comfortable having my, my child get on a plane for the first time to a city that they had no job and knew one person, but they believed in me. Um, shortly after arriving in Seattle, I had the opportunity to work for a large global international logistics carrier. And boy, did my change, life change from there. Who would have thought the glory would start in picking up documents from the airport and bringing them to the customs office and working on l large global clients? So I learned a lot. Um, it gave me a lot of gratitude to see tennis shoes that I cleared for a large company with a swoosh on it be at the US Open. And fortunately, I found my way to West Michigan. 
There have been incredible mentors throughout my career, those that allowed me to fail and learn from those failures, pick myself back up, challenge me when I needed to be challenged, and just give me that push when I needed it. The amount of collaboration that w is in our community is amazing. I don't think people that haven't lived outside Michigan and have come to this part of Michigan really understand it. And when I talk to colleagues across the state, they're like, what do you guys do in this community? Well, it's in the, the water, I think. It's in the community. And it's a very special place to do business, especially on international. I think my first thought is you had to be on the coast to do international business. But the little did I know as a teen, picking weeds out of the soybeans in rural southern Minnesota, that I was actually part of that international supply chain because a lot of the soybeans from the fields in Minnesota actually make it around the world. So I would have not have accomplished what I've been able to thus far without the help and support of so many. So thank you so much for the international partners that we have in our community, for the team at the Van Andel Global Trade Center. Thank you so much, Catherine, Mark, and Molly for all your help. We have a lean, mean team and I couldn't do it without them. Thank you to all our student assistants, the dean's office, her staff, um, all of my colleagues, and the West, I am proud member of the West District Expert Council, so thank you, Kendra, for believing in me and, and having me on your team. Thank you to the Trade Center's Global Advisory Board. Greg, I thank you for making out today. Um, and to all the members of our Trade Council that we have, that we run each month, great ideas come from all the people in this community. And thank you to my family. Thank you to my husband, Andrew, and my two kids. Evan, it's not just getting out of school today. Learn something today. So thank you so much, and I am extremely honored to receive this award, and I hopefully will hold Hillman Orr proud. So thank you. Thank you. I'm so moved. I would like to extend my heartfelt thanks to Diana and to Michael and to the board members of the U.S. Uh, of the West Michigan World Affairs Council. Um, I'm truly honored by this important award and more than thankful for the mission that you accomplished through your work. Being recognized with the Hillman Ord Award is even sweeter because I get to share it with Sonia as the celebration of our long-lasting partnership. Looking back to how I got here, I'm very thankful for three key areas in my life. I'll happen to start with the letter C. First, I'm thankful for C for commerce. Working with the Department of Commerce, I help companies to export their products. I'm immensely grateful for the trust and confidence that they have given, our clients have given us to broaden their sales internationally. The US Commercial Service has been uh, key into helping companies expand their sales across borders. And our success stories of our clients are a true uh, testament to the importance of international trade and also to the significant impact it can have on our local economy. Commerce has offered me a chance to meet with many excellent industry leaders here in Michigan and also work with, com with colleagues in over 80 different countries. Um, beyond that, I'm very thankful for um, being surrounded by mentors, partners, and colleagues, many of here who are here today. Ali and Jennifer, thank you for uh, being instrumental in helping me to succeed. I'm grateful for all of you. My second CEO is commitment. And really, uh, this word should be family, but I didn't think building a theme off of three F words would be good. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you to my family, for my loving and committed family. To my parents, thank you for teaching me the, uh, the values of hard work and, and compassion. To my husband, Edward, thank you for always having my back while always giving me something to look forward to. And to my boys, thank you. I, I can't take full credit for who the wonderful people that you're becoming. But just know that even as I get this award, you're my biggest accomplishment, and I'm most proud of you. And I didn't cry. Check that out. <laughs> <laughs> Lastly, I'm thankful for the sea of community. Grand Rapids is a mid-sized city that does major things. It's small enough to run into your clients at the baseball field or soccer field at a high school sports event. And it's yet big enough to host thousands of exporters. It's big enough to support public schools that offer Mandarin immersion. It's big enough to attract talented artists who perform at world-class venues like the Meyer Gardens and the Van Andel Arena. And it's big enough to fill a room of interesting people like yourselves who are here committed to learning about international things and, and are willing to learn and, and enjoy dialogue with uh, international thought leaders like Mr. Beasley. So once again, thank you to the World Affairs Council, 
it's really an honor that I will cherish forever. Um, but more importantly, thank you for building our community into one that uh, truly cherishes and encourages and com is committed to thoughtful global engagement. Thank you. Thank you, Diana, and congratulations again. Really fantastic, Kendra and Sonia. And thank you to the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan for providing us with this unique and special afternoon of important programming. On behalf of my colleagues at Bank of America, we are deeply grateful to be part of celebrating the diplomatic legacy of Michigan Senator Arthur Vandenberg and the foresight of the council founders, Douglas Hillman and Edgar Orr, to honor Governor Beasley, Sonia Johnson, and Kendra Kuo for modeling international engagement is important and a hallmark of our world-aware community in West Michigan. At Bank of America, we understand that in order to achieve our mission of making financial lives better through the power of connection, and to support the businesses and the people of West Michigan to help them succeed in their goals, we must be a globally astute region. In today's world, that power of connection cannot just be local. It must be global. Therefore, it is our honor for Bank of America to co-sponsor the World Affairs Council program with our friends at Meyer and Amway. We are eager to listen first, to thoughtfully engage the conversation, and to consider new ways to connect that all, so that all can succeed, both here in West Michigan and around the world. And today, it is my honor to introduce you, Governor David Beasley. The first three Vandenberg Prizes went to Ambassador John Huntsman, Jr., General James Mattis, and Ambassador Marie Yovanovitch. If you have seen or heard Governor Beasley on 60 Minutes or the BBC or NPR, you know that the governor's lauded work as the executive director of United Nations World Food Program more than qualifies for him to become our fourth Vandenberg Prize recipient. As executive director of the United Nations World Food Program, or the WFP, from 2017 to 2023, David Beasley continued his life's work bridging political, religious, and ethnic boundaries to champion economic development and education. At the World Food Program, Governor Beasley used four decades of leadership and communication skills to mobilize financial support and public awareness for the global fight against hunger. These efforts were recognized when the Norwegian Nobel Committee awarded the United Nations World Food Program the 2020 Nobel Peace Prize. The fight against hunger is even more critical now, with rates steadily rising because of persistent conflict, the impact of climate change, and most recently, the COVID-19 pandemic. And under Governor Beasley's leadership, the WFP has mobilized the resources required to respond to an ever-expanding caseload of people requiring food assistance. In 2021, the agency reached over 128 million people. That was the highest annual total in its history. His charismatic leadership and relentless international diplomacy has saved lives. And when he began at WFP, the agency raised $6 billion a year to do its important work. But upon leaving his post, the WFP raised $14.2 billion annually. Governor Beasley is also driving greater focus and attention to the WFP's work beyond emergency food assistance, highlighting how longer-term development can help bring peace and stability to troubled regions. Before coming to WFP in April of 2017, Governor Beasley spent a decade working with high-profile leaders and on-the-ground program managers in more than 100 countries, directing projects de designed to, to foster peace, 
reconciliation, and economic progress. He traveled to as many as 30 countries a year, organizing, leading, and participating in conferences and missions in Kosovo, South Sudan, Sudan, Tunisia, and Yemen, among others. His work has allowed him to develop deep relationships with leaders around the world. As governor of South Carolina from 1995 until 1999, he guided the state during years of economic transformation, helping to reshape the state's economy into a healthy, diverse, and robust market. Mr. Beasley was the first governor in South Carolina to make a public push for the removal of the Confederate battle flag from the state Capitol Dome, a move that earned him the John F. Kennedy Profile in Courage Award. Governor Beasley attended Clemson University and the University of South Carolina, where he received his JD degree. And he was first elected to public office at the age of 21 as a member of the South Carolina House of Representatives. He is married to Mary Wood Payne and is the father of four children. In the tradition of Arthur Vandenberg, the patron saint of our World Affairs Council in Western Michigan, and with the global vision of our native son, President Gerald R. Ford, we are delighted to present the 2023 Vandenberg Prize to Governor David Beasley. Renee, thank you, and, and as you properly introduced my wife, Mary Wood, as she waves her hand, and so that's 90% of the reason I've had any success at all, and the 10% is when I have my failures, but Hank, it's great to be here, it, it really is, and I want to tell you some things that you don't know about Grand Rapids. I would not be standing here on behalf of the World Food Program as a Nobel Peace Prize laureate had it not been for Grand Rapids. We would not have received the $7.4 billion we received from the United States government last year had it not been for Grand Rapids. The world affairs impact that this community has from the men and women who came before you. Yes, Vandenberg, we know the history extraordinary impact on the world from an isolationist to internationalist, NATO, Marshall Plan, United Nations peacekeeping, things that I've been significantly engaged in, Gerald Ford, of course president, healing of a nation in a time of great need. But these two men did some things and laid a groundwork that you're not quite familiar with. Every Wednesday, the United States senators, a group of them, Democrats and Republicans, take their labels off and they go into the Vandenberg Room, a group of men and women that have been meeting senators only since World War II. Vandenberg was an instrumental part of this group, praying for the nation and the world. Your president, Ford, was a key member of the House group that meets every Thursday morning. Why is that significant to me? Because it was those leaders in the House and the Senate that talked me in to take in this role that I did not want to do. The greatest job I've ever had in my life, helping the poor, the needy, those who are in great need. Before I took this role in a commitment, I had an absolute ironclad agreement from all the Democrat and Republican leaders of these groups that if Trump zeroed out the budget, they would fight to put it back in. I call it the miracle on Pennsylvania Avenue. <laughs> Democrats and Republicans who are fighting over everything, as you see nowadays, agreeing on nothing. But when I walk inside that U.S. Capitol, I see the Democrats and Republicans laying aside their differences, laying aside their labels and coming together for food security, the help of the poor and needy around the world, because it's that spirit of loving your neighbor 
that they truly understand the impact. And I've made the case all over the world from parliaments all over the world that if you're not going to do it out of the goodness of your heart, then let me give you the financial basis and the national security basis by which you shall do it because it will cost you a thousand times more not to help the poor and the needy where they are. In the last four or five years, because of the funding from the United States and other donors, we've been able to avert massive famine, mass destabilization of nations, and mass migration, a cost that would have been in the trillions had it not been for men and women like you supporting congressmen and women in the Senate and in the House. This morning, I was taking an early morning walk, and I'd already seen the statute of Vandenberg. I'd already seen the statute of Gerald Ford, but I had not seen the statute of Helen J. Clayter an activist against racism and for civil rights. I saw this statue and I'm like, who is this? And I went up and began to read and at the bottom was one of her quotes, God made us diverse and we have to live in harmony. And I'm thinking, what influence did she have on Vandenberg? What influence did she have on Gerald Ford and vice versa? That these three people, just three out of many that have planted seeds of hope in midst despair. And when you think about the simple fact that 200 years ago, 1.1 billion people on planet Earth, 95% of the people were in extreme poverty. The struggles, the successes, the systems, the programs that we've built over the past 200 years, now less than 10% in extreme poverty. So as I tell young people, don't tear down systems that are actually helping and working, but try telling that to the 10% we're not reaching. We don't quit, we don't stop, we don't give up. We continue to th thrive and strive and work to reach that final 10%. Everything that I do is based upon the simple teaching that transcends all religions, all cultures, all politics, love your neighbor as yourself, if you know this from the Talmud that Moses gave to the people from God. Jesus quotes it, but I had a Jewish rabbi who heard me speaking about this great teaching because I have found it doesn't matter whether you're talking to an atheist, a Muslim, a Christian, a Hindu, a Buddhist, everyone loves this teaching. But this Jewish rabbi said the actual ancient translation more accurately says, love your neighbor as your equal. When you feed 160 million people, on any given day, week, or month. You learn a lot about people. And when he enlightened me about this verse, it was like the lights came on. Every human being on the face of the planet is created in the image of God. We're all equal. But yet we're all, as Helen Clayter said, we're all diverse. And let's live in harmony. So when Jesus said, when I was hungry and you did not feed me, when I was thirsty, you did not give me drink, et cetera, et cetera. And they said, well, when were you hungry, et cetera? And he says, when you didn't do it, the least of these, you didn't do it to me. You see, that's the image of God. And so when I deny a child food or the help to the poor, I'm denying the image of God. If you want to love God, help the poor. And so we've been able to reach 160 million people last year, raising $14 billion, $39.4 million per day. Why? Because of the men and women in Grand Rapids who laid the framework, the foundation, the seeds planted, and the hard work that have resulted in a harvest of which I didn't labor for. But before us came these types of leaders out of Grand Rapids. The world will not be dynamically changed by Washington, D.C., it's right here in Grand Rapids. America's great because America is good. If America ever does cease to be good, we will cease to be great. Am I concerned about the future of America? You bet I am. But I also have great hope. One of the toughest questions I've gotten on television is, how do I not get so depressed, seeing so much starvation and struggling? And I said, when you're out there, I can be in Aleppo 
with the rubble of bombs and missiles and IEDs, and a little child will come from behind a war-torn building, and it's like a flower in the desert. And I see that little child is my little brother, my little sister. And when there's $430 trillion worth of wealth on the planet, and any child struggles, much less dies, shame on us. Shame on us. And we will never end poverty and hunger through philanthropy alone, though it's important. That's why you are so important. Cross-pollinating, cooperating, coordinating, collaborating all around the world, bringing us all together. Grand Rapids, that is the model that the rest of our nation and the rest of the world needs. It's this spirit that gives us hope and gives us light. I had a friend tell me one time, all the darkness in the world can't put out the light of one little match. And in this room, ah, there's a combustion. Thank you and blessings to you all. Thank you. go from there. That was so inspiring. Uh, and congratulations on the honor you've received today and, and for sharing a few moments of your career with us. And such a distinguished career. And as, as we've been enjoying a, a bountiful luncheon, um, I can't help but think of one of your quotes that said, we're taking away from the hungry to feed the starving. Help us understand what that is. Oh, that's a hard. What's, what's the landscape look like in world hunger? Yeah, pretty bad. And so, um, in, the, in the last couple of years, when we don't have enough food or enough money, bottom line. And so, uh, when I took this job, there were 80 million people out of a 7.6 billion population at the time, 2017, that were what we call marching to starvation, not knowing where the next meal's coming from. So I take this role, and I'm thinking, 80 million. I'm going to put the World Food Program out of business. There's no way we can't do that. As a former governor, goals, objectives, benchmarks, measurables, execute. Well, the number went from 80 million to 135 in two years. Why? Man-made conflict to climate shocks, COVID hits, supply chain disruption, economic devastation, particularly to the poorest of the poor. You imagine you were struggling to get maybe toilet paper at a grocery store. Maybe not yours, but. Even ours. <laughs> <clears throat> but you can imagine what was happening to the supply chain in Chad, in Mali, Haiti. The number went from 135 to 276 million. That's before Ukraine, the breadbasket of the world, grows enough food to feed 400 million people. The number went to 350 million people. And out of that, 40 million knocking on famine's door. So when we don't have enough money, we have to take food from hungry children to give it to starving children. And I can, that's not hypothetical. That's not theoretical. I can go from country to country and show you which countries there will be wasting and stunting and severe, severe impact over the next two, three generations because of what's happening right now. Um, it's, it's bad out there and it's going to get worse. And the conflicts, of course, don't go away. Uh, you've been instrumental in helping uh, Ukraine recover yeah. some of that ability to feed mm. part of the world. Uh, what do you see happening there? Well, the Black Sea Grain Initiative, which obviously we were you know, the ones front and center on that. So when the war took place and Russia was invading from the east side, uh, I immediately knew that that's not where we need to focus on. I said, because they're the breadbasket of the world. They grow enough food, right, to feed 400 million people, and most of that goes through the ports. Their whole infrastructure system is through those ports, thousands of trains per day. And so I knew that if we didn't get those ports open, because Putin and Russia had a blockade on the entire coastline, that they would collapse economically. The devastation of particularly African countries depended upon Ukrainian grain, in which we were one of the largest producers and providers and purchasers in the world from Ukraine. And so 
I went immediately down to Odessa. I mean, missiles were flying over from the Russian ships out, the, out in the uh, Black Sea and, uh, and, and another sea, but uh, had a pretty hard conversation. Tweeted out to Putin. I said, Putin, you're going to bring famine to the rest of the world unless you open up these ports. And it created the window. He, I don't want to say he blinked, but I did it in such a way that I was trying to kind of push him but not kick him because he can react like some other presidents we know. And so we got it worked out. Now, it's still very tenuous, uh, which is a whole other story. But then you compound that with the fertilizer crisis, which has been just, uh, I mean, catastrophic, particularly on smallholder farmers in Africa. Cause, and like in Africa, which should grow enough food to feed the world, but because of lack of strategic good leadership, I mean, that continent will feed the world one day. But 70% of their food comes from smallholder farmers. They can't afford the fuel nor the fertilizer if they can get it. And so that's a crisis on top of a crisis on top of a crisis that has not fully unfolded yet. So in the next eight to 12 months, really be on the lookout. Uh, I just hope we can continue to awaken the leaders not to ignore this because you will pay for it with not just death and starvation, but mass migration, destabilization of these nations, which I can give the anecdotal, evidential numbers on how much it will cost compared to doing it right early on. Yeah, when you talk about destabilization, we, we think of feeding the hungry, but governments collapse when the hungry aren't fed. They do. So when you go back and look in 2007 and 8, they had 48, 49 countries of riot, civil unrest, and protests. Look at the economic indicators and factors in. Today, much, much, much worse. And the African national debt of most poor countries is substantially higher, so they don't have the capacity to do safety net programs like they did back then. So it's a, it's a predicament, which is why I was able to convince the United States Congress, the Democrats and Republicans, to come to together and do an unprecedented appropriation last year. <coughs> this year's not going to be so good. Well, and you, you touched, uh, speaking of bipartisanship, you touched on that. Uh, you had originally said the UN was not your cup of tea <laughs> and you were not going to take this job. Now, you touched on some of the underpinnings of that, but um, that bipartisan commitment is pretty magical when you can make it work. Well, it is. You know, uh, I mean, Vandenberg, hadn't been for Vandenberg, you know, we wouldn't have the United Nations peacekeeping, the Marshall Plan, NATO, all of these things. And so, you know, every organization has its strengths and weaknesses. You know that, whether it's in the corporate world or, the, or philanthropy or the United Nations. And so when I got a phone call about what I consider this, it was a friend of mine from the United Nations, and Trump had just gotten elected, and, and, uh, and I was flown up to Washington to meet with some of the senators and some of the friends. And this is in, uh, right after the election, about a month, few weeks after the election. And... Um, and the phone rings. It was from one of my left-wing liberal atheist friends. Uh, it says, Governor, how you doing? And I said, I'm fine. And I said, Bob, I know you well enough. You don't call to chit-chat. What do you want? He says, well, you know we're afraid of Trump. And I said, <laughs> you should be. Because <laughs> you know? all of his comments about cutting you know, international aid and all this stuff. And, uh, and so he knew that I knew Trump and, you know, had a good relationship with, with everybody in the party, so to speak. And so I said, well, so what do you want? He said, will you consider taking a role, a senior role in the United Nations or the administration? I said, I didn't do it with Bush, who was one of my best friends, and I have no intention of doing it now. But the night before, my wife, that Alabama girl right there, <laughs> said, the world's in trouble. And before you say no, at least pray about it. So I remembered that when I was about to tell Bob, see you later. And I said, Bob, let me make a phone call. So I called a former uh, Democrat congressman from Dayton, Ohio, Tony Hall. I said, Tony, tell me about the World Food Program. Oh, my God, if there's God's work on earth. I said, Tony, the United Nations World Food Program. <laughs> and we laughed. And he said, no, it's an amazing organization. I said, Tony, I said, you know, I'm an old NASCAR fan. And there are four turns in the track. And at my age, I'm on that fourth turn, last straightaway, and I want to be efficient, effective, and I want to get it done. And I just don't see the United Nations as being that. And he says, trust me, you're at the right place at the right time. Amazing. And it was those Democrats and Republicans who came together and still come together. And I could go through the names from state to state to state 
uh, how they really lay aside the differences in this spirit. And it's that spirit that's not male or female, Gentile nor Jew, that's really brothers and sisters of, of the Almighty. And so that's what gives me a lot of hope in even the most desperate times. But Well, in, in that initial reaction to the United Nations, it, it's easy for us, for American politicians, to beat up on the UN. Yeah. Uh, and we'd all like to see things go differently sometimes. But is that a communication challenge? What can the UN do to become a, 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 a oh, body that wins back our confidence? Wow. So I don't know if I should say this publicly, but here it goes. So <laughs> I'm in the first couple of weeks of the job. And Peter, you know, I'm goals, objectives, benchmarks, execute. And so I was going to these UN meetings, and we're just sitting there talking and talking and talking. And then one of the first big meetings, there's like six hours of talking. And so I, I walk out the hallway, a little tea break, and, and the Secretary General, I said, Antonio, I need to talk to you. I said, I'm sorry, but I've been sitting through six hours with the biggest pile of, I'm not going to say that, but I said it to him, you know what? I need, it's not like if I don't raise money, we don't get better furniture. We don't raise money, people die. I said, I can't sit in those kind of meetings. He wasn't chairing that meeting. He said, will you help me change it? I said, I absolutely will. And so they changed the leader of this particular essential committee. And he called me and said, I understand that you're upset. I said, I'm not upset. I'm just not coming to your meetings. <laughs> I said, I've got to raise millions of dollars a day. I don't have time to sit through this kind of stuff. And he said, well, you give me a chance. I said, why? You tell me why I should give you a chance, I'll listen to it. He did, he explained it. I said, all right, I'm going to come to the first meeting. So I called a couple of the other leaders, went to the meeting, and the meeting took half the time. I sat by the door, because I was planning <laughs> on leaving, and he looked at me and I said, thumbs up. And so, but the, the interesting dynamic, though, was in the, in the communications language, because the UN speaks a lingo in a language like most people don't understand. They don't. And so I called a lot of you know what, the first year about the lingo of the language I use, because I like, you know, instead of, oh, gosh, IPC level three, four, five, food insecurity, well, is that gonna motivate a taxpayer in Grand Rapids to say, I'm gonna send more money to Niger because they got a bad IPC level three. <laughs> Just doesn't quite work, does it? But hey, let me tell you about these starving children. If, it, if you don't do this, here's what's gonna happen, because they're gonna be at your border or you go destabilize, you have war and conflict, and they get it. So the first few months especially, I caught a lot of grief about the way I talked. But once our funding level was starting going up, 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 because I was doing radio and television and speaking to parliaments around the world, our funding level was going up. Well, after about six months or so, how do you say that again, you know? <laughs> but language is critical. And so what we did, we changed the global lingo and now we've got presidents and prime ministers using our phraseologies that really has brought global food security at the highest level it's ever been at the G7, the G20 uh, a level, that kind of thing. But I'm very concerned about where it's going, but that's a different discussion. You, I think you've, you've talked about some of this, but um, we think of the U.S. model for international engagement based on the, the three Ds, development, defense, and diplomacy. Uh, how can people in this room best engage in the fight against hunger? What, where, where do we fit yeah, into I, that? I, it's kind of like Mother Teresa. You know, I quoted her when I gave the Nobel Peace Prize speech. First, it's all about your home. You know, take care of your family, your neighborhood, your community, because you've got people struggling right here in Michigan, uh, all over the country. That don't mean we neglect our neighbors somewhere else, but you get neighbors also across the street, across the railroad tracks, as you would say. And so that's important. But development is the key. Because uh, I've been pretty hard on, on, on some of the United Nations because when I would go to a country, and I, I did a thousand flights in the last six years. Every day, every seven days a week, how quick I can move, because I'm, I, my goal when I got there was to raise a million dollars an hour, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And that would have taken us up to about, do the math, eight or nine billion dollars. Well, when I left, we were raising $39.4 billion million per day. So what meetings I did not go to, my team don't put me in meetings that aren't strategic. Where I sit on the plane, where I go, how I move, all these things are critical. But one of the things that I would do when I would go out to the countries, let's say Chad or uh, Burkina Faso, I would meet with the UN leadership. 
and say, how long have you been in this country? Proudly, 30, 40 years. I'm like, uh, maybe it's not working. <laughs> Why are you still here? Maybe you need to rethink this. What do we need to do differently so that a nation can take care of themselves and not be dependent upon us? So that gets into development and resilience work. That's critical. Just bringing in food, bringing in money, that's very important in a short-term crisis. Right. But long-term, that's not the solution. And so the World Food Program, not many people realize this, but just in the past few years, I said and thought every able-bodied food recipient ought to be in a community improvement project. Over 109,000 holding ponds, reservoirs, and small dams we built, mm. the beneficiaries built. 80 one to 3,000 kilometers of feeder roads, 29,000 kilometers of irrigation canals, rehabilitated over 4 million acres of land so that when a drought, a flash flood, a climate shock, a Ukraine shock happens, they don't need but a little bit, if at all, outside support. Mm -hmm. So development and resilience is critical. So what I've been asking investors, Wall Street, big companies, big companies, you're a big company, <laughs> is be willing to go, for example, in the developing nations. Your philanthropy, I appreciate it, thank you, but I need for you to engage. Help build the systems, the transparency, the chains of supply, et cetera, that will allow success. Be willing to make a little bit less over a longer period of time, put up with a little more inefficiencies. It'll take some time, but it will reap incredible benefits over time. And so I've been pushing some of the top agricultural companies, fertilizer companies in the world to let's come together and see what we can do in places like Sudan. And pla that's a whole nother discussion because of the war right now, but, but anyway. Well, and a lot of those companies are American. And what, what is yeah. the reputation of the U.S. globally? You, you, I mean, you've, you've traveled everywhere. Are, are, are we held in esteem? Have we squandered some of our leadership? What, what, what's the, I mean, this is a, such a broad question, but generally, yeah, what yeah. do people think of us? The people around the world love the American people, and they love the American spirit. And they know it's been America that's reached out all over the world. And the leadership that we are providing in helping the poor and the needy around the world in rebuilding, I mean, like World War II, Germany, Japan, now our greatest partners in so many ways. But I'm very concerned about where we are now. Uh, I really am. A lot of propaganda, but the leaders in the world, particularly in the industrialized nations, have got to come together and be more strategic to address long-term issues, not to get into those particular issues right now. I've been meeting with a lot of the major players around the world in private and having this heart-to-heart -heart conversation. Uh, you've got to slow down a little bit. I said, it's like children playing that game whack-a-mole. You know, you just touch it and you move on, punch it. And no one's given the depth of attention necessary to end the Syrian war, to end the Ethiopian, to end the Yemen, to resolve the Ukraine, Venezuela, Cuba. These things need to get resolved so the temperature of the planet comes down so that we can truly move forward with other major issues that will bring about global peace, stability, food security, that, because right now we're 8 billion people. Well, we're gonna be at 10, 12 billion people, and climate issues are only gonna get more problematic over the next who knows how long, who knows, but anyway, so. And with all that to think about, I can't help but want to ask you, uh, Renee mentioned the Confederate flag over the State House in South Carolina, and, um, the year before your re-election as governor, you called for it to be taken down, which is, again, that was a, a profile and courage moment. What were the thoughts behind that and uh, what the genesis of that initiative? Well, any political hack with any intellect would say do it after the election. <laughs> <laughs> right. I remember I was in, uh, I think it was Seoul, Korea, me and Zell Miller, the former U.S. Marine governor, senator from Georgia, I said, Zell, let me, you know, talk to you a minute. And he was kind of like an old elder brother, fatherly figure, had a lot of respect. And I said, I, I, I'm going to call for the removal of the Confederate flag. And Zell put his arm around me, son, you need to think long and hard before you do that. <laughs> uh, you can't imagine how visceral, how, I mean, it was incredible. Yeah. Uh, 
it was the right thing to do. And as a couple of major uh, U.S. columnists said after my defeat, you're the last living casualty of the Civil War. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, I, I remember bringing my staff in that night. And, uh, and we could, my numbers were out of the roof until I touched the flag. Mm. And uh, I said, let me ask you three questions. Did we do what was right? And they said, yes. Did we do what was right when it was right to do it? And they said, reluctantly, yes. We wish you'd waited after the election. <laughs> I said, when we did what was right at the right time, did we do it the right way? Not out of judgment and bitterness and hatred, but out of love and compassion and of bringing people together. They said, yes. I said, so we've been successful. Let the rest take care of itself. And so, anyway, it's that really was a Confederate prove, flag. Proven yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hey. Good. You ready, ready for some from the audience? Can we take some from the audience? Be yes, I think we're ready. Be I, I just wanted to say, before we turn to the audience for a couple of questions, you hardly seem like someone who's comfortable sitting back now after these arduous labors and retiring. Uh, what do you, what's your next adventure? Well, I've been chainsawing and bush hogging back on my farm in South Carolina. Uh, in fact, yesterday morning, before I got on that plane to come here, I was having the best time of my life. And so I've been telling everybody around the world, give me a couple of months. I want to just take a break, because I've I literally been going seven days a week for six straight years. Uh, Mary Wood can tell you. I mean, it's just been boom, boom, boom. But that's what it, that's what it took. And uh, who knows what's next? I'm not anxious about it. Uh, I'm trying to be really uh, quiet about it and, and see what uh, the Almighty has to say about it. Uh, and not just all my friends. <laughs> well, we'll be following the Almighty's instruction with great curiosity. <laughs> yeah, you got a lot of people want me to run again. I'm like, you know, if God does a neon sign, I'm in. But until I see that neon sign... <laughs> Well, let's see if we've got time for just a couple of questions from uh, the audience. Does anybody have a, anybody have a question I'd like to ask uh, the governor, follow up on some of this conversation? Yeah. Hi there. I'm actually really loud. I, I, I guess well, you know, we got a, it's a big room. Yeah. You might have to help me hear the question. Governor, thank you so much. And uh, Mr. Meyer, thank you so much for being here today, for your commitment to food equity and to anti-hunger work. It is really critical work, and, and basic needs are everything. There are many of us in this room today that are part of philanthropic organizations that are working specifically in food equity and food access. And I'm curious, Governor, what is your advice for those of us that are working in the trenches day in and day out, especially at a time when philanthropic resources are less right now, juxtaposed to more need, and we're experiencing that on a day-to-day -day basis. So what would your advice be? Well, wow, that's um, a lengthy discussion, as you know, but number one, just keep doing what you're doing, you know, helping the poor and the needy. Uh, there's some great, I think, a scripture in, in uh, Proverbs, if those who are helping the poor with a pure heart will come before the kings, you know, catch the attention of the kings. Um, I think because of the World Food Program, 23,000 employees out there working, putting their lives on the line every day, uh, they're honored when you step in, because leaders want to, they're moved. We're created to be moved by goodness. And I think be more visible, but not, don't be superficial, of course. Authenticity is the most powerful thing when you're helping the poor. Uh, make your actions known in such a way that doesn't look duplicitous or like hey, you're in it for yourselves, this kind of thing. How do, you, how do you message that? How do you get more people in the community involved, community awareness? Leaders like myself who give more speeches and do more radio and television. One of the things that I did, um, and like in South Carolina, we did uh, a lot of stuff on race relations. Uh, and, and not just junk. I mean, you get a lot of junk out there. And one of the things I did one time in a small town, I brought the black pastors and the white pastors together, and I chewed both of them out. I mean, I literally just chewed them both out. And, and then I said, all right, I said to the black pastors, I said, this Sunday I want you to ask everybody in your congregations to invite a white person to lunch, someone you don't really know that well. Don't talk politics. Get to know each other. And same thing to the white pastors. They were all, I mean, crying at the end, 
realizing that, you know, we got so much to learn from one another and being together, hearing the stories. And, I, I, and what we did, like in South Carolina, because um, we dropped our welfare rate like 75, 80%. And I had every church, and I went public, and I told the churches in private, I said, if you don't do this, I will come after you publicly. So we're going to provide a job for everybody on welfare that we possibly can. So I want every church adopting a family, because in every church, it could be a synagogue, it could be a you know, mosque, whatever. So in almost every house of faith, there's a plumber, there's an electrician, there's a dentist, there's a teacher, there's a, a lawyer. <laughs> and anyway, go adopt that family, cross-pollinate. And it was amazing what happened. The wealthy people were impacted more than the poor people. And they began loving and hearing the stories of one another. It was absolutely a remarkable thing. And when you had in the past few years all these riots around the country, and you remember you had the, the black guy shot in the back by the white cop in North Charleston, then you had the, the white kid, racist kid, went and shot the eight people. Did you see any riots? In South Carolina? You didn't, did you? Because of the groundwork that had been laid by people of faith all over the state helping one another. Is there more work to be done? Yes, a lot more to be done. Now I want to tell this real quick story. So you've never heard of this woman, but you remember when Dylan Roof walked into that black church and killed those guys in Charleston, South Carolina. I got phone calls from all over the world, from Buddhists, Hindus, Muslims, Christians, Orthodox, Catholic. They were brokenhearted about the killing, but what blew them away? Three days later, those family members were forgiving that guy on international television. People were so blown away. How could they forgive this guy? It was such a pure act of unconditional love. It devastated. But you never heard about what happened two months earlier when this white cop shot this black guy in the back. There was a television interview with the mother. And the mother, this was in April, two months before June. And the reporter was kind of badgering her a little bit of racism, racism. And she says, I know I should be mad. I know I should be angry. But my God told me to love my enemy. My God told me to forgive. And I'm going to forgive that man. And I'm going to love that man. Holy mackerel. That didn't go viral around the world. It went viral in Charleston, South Carolina. So that woman planted the seeds so that when Dylan Roof did what he did, the seed had been planted of forgiveness and love. Incredible act of love by one simple, ordinary, extraordinary person created in the image of God. So keep up the good work. I know it was a long answer, but I want to throw that story in. It's a great story. Right? Great. We, got, we, have, we have one more. Anybody with a question? Uh, I've, got a, I've got a question. Um, there t uh, there's a, an obvious uh, ramping up of spending to fight climate change. Uh, and what do you see with the priorities of where that money's going to go? Specifically, are the priorities going to be right in light of world hunger? What's going to be the net effect? Is it going to take away? Is it going to enhance? What is it going to do in light of? I, I've given some talks on this uh, way back. This is a very grave concern of mine. Uh, because on climate funding, they're talking about mitigation, mitigation, mitigation. I said, well, you better talk about adaptation. Because those are the nations that you'll have mass migration destabilization if you don't have adaptation. So that's what we've been focused on, rehabilitating the land, water systems in place so they don't need outside support and they don't migrate, and et cetera, et cetera. Because the migration we're going to be looking at in the next 12 months out of Syria with an extraordinary infiltration by ISIS, Al-Qaeda, as well as the northern Sahel with ISIS and Al-Qaeda. When we're in putting down resilience programs, uh, adaptation on climate, for example. Here's what happens. Because ISIS and Al-Qaeda, I, I can just, the day that I got the phone call on the Nobel Peace Prize, I was in Niger. I was in a hostile meeting with the government leadership, the president who was a friend of mine. 
But I was earlier that morning, I was out there in the field, and I had ISIS a little bit to the north of me, about 10 miles, and I had Al Qaeda to the south of me, five or 10 miles. And they used blockades, cutting supply chains, so they weaponized food. They'll cut off the food supply, and then they will recruit using food and medicines. So if I can't get into those places, then the ISIS Al Qaeda numbers go up. And the mothers, I've had more mothers tell me, Mr. Beasley, my son, my husband didn't want to join ISIS, but we hadn't fed our little girl in two weeks. What were we supposed to do? It's not like they can jump in a car and, and drive over to Lansing. It just doesn't work that way. So when we can come in with the strategic programs, here's what happens. Migration drops off the chart. You can quantify that economically. Teen pregnancy and marriage rate of 12, 13-year-olds when we have school meals programs drops off the chart. Recruitment by ISIS and Al-Qaeda drops off the chart. Quantify that compared to the cost. It's a thousand times more. So this is what we must do. Adaptation is absolutely essential and critical. And I see so much of these dollars not being strategically placed and the numbers now on the countries that need it the most for adaptation are the countries that are not getting it. We need a Marshall Plan. You need to old revive the old Marshall Plan for all these countries. Where are the greatest needs? What needs to be done? How should it be done? Because I'm seeing, in my opinion, a lot of money not being strategically used without getting in too many of the weeds at this stage of the day. Governor. Thank you so much. It's been a real pleasure and real honor to have you with us. Thank you all for being with us today. I'm Michael Vendenen. I'm the Executive Director of the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan. Uh, special thanks and congratulations to Governor Beasley, to Sonia and Kendra, our friends from near and far. Let's give them one more round of applause to thank them. Great work. If you're not one of our 50 corporate and civic members or 11 university partners, I encourage you to join what we do here at the World Affairs Council of Western Michigan. You can learn more about what we do at worldmichigan.org. In, in these tumultuous times in our community and our world, I close with the verse from scripture that last year's recipient, Ambassador Yovanovitch, used as the epigraph in her memoir, Lessons from the Edge. And it comes from 1 Corinthians 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of these is love. Best wishes in all your endeavors, and have a great week. <laughs>